Hi, this is Jeff Gewen with the Chemical Heritage Foundation, which is the Center for the History of Chemistry, a museum, library, and Center for Scholars in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is defining goals, objectives, and tactics for digital media planning. And we're talking about this in the context of heritage organizations. So in 2013, strategic planning for the web and digital media is pretty much still a rarity among heritage organizations. Often our preferred approach is to nurture innovative ideas ahead of audience needs or the sustainability of the approach over time. The web, digital libraries, social media, and mobile tools provide effective platforms for heritage advocacy but truly leveraging these technologies means continually re-anchoring them with strategic context over the course of time. The key to successfully translating good ideas and intentions for outreach through web and digital media is to develop them into to more defined goals, objectives, and tactics that can be measured for mission-based results among audiences. So what this paper is going to do is describe the strategic planning approach and how it's being applied to organizations that seek to advocate for heritage through digital means. The strategic planning process is comprised of three levels of focus, goals, objectives, and tactics. This approach can be effectively executed regardless of the size, scope, or resources of an organization. The first area of focus is goals. Goals are simple, general statements that are rooted in mission. They're based in changing an organization's position in reputation, relationships, or the work of accomplishing mission-based directives. They collectively describe a perfect world scenario. Because they're stated in present tense and contain layered meaning, uh, they inspire motivation and they remain evergreen. Second area of focus are objectives. So while the goals function as an organizational compass, objectives define a time and place for recognizing a successful stop along the journey. Objectives are a critical success factor, but they're rarely articulated because of the discomfort that their specificity implies. They focus on inspiring measurable action, acceptance, or awareness that make organizational goals a practical pursuit. Eleven criteria define the ideal objective. The first is they support mission-based organizational goals. Second, they're focused on a specific audience. Third, they emphasize impact, not products. Number four, they're rooted in research. Five, their wording is semantically clear. Six, they're measurable. Seven, they're time-defined. Eight, they focus on one result from one audience. Nine, they challenge the organization. 10, they're attainable, and 11, they're accepted throughout the organization. It's easy to report web hits and time spent visiting a website. Establishing if that's a value and then putting a number to it is critical to establish momentum. These numbers can be determined through evaluation of an organization's existing audience interaction or results achieved by a similar organization online. As the plan is updated or iterated over the course of time, a truer understanding of audience will develop and a more targeted number can be assigned. Tactics are the tools, platforms, and approaches identified in the plan that most efficiently interface with the targeted audiences to accomplish the organizational objectives. In social media, for example, these could include things like Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. So I'm going to give you a few case studies of various heritage organizations that have implemented strategic planning for their digital initiatives, and then tell you a little bit about the outcomes from that. We're going to start with the Michigan State University Campus Archaeology Program, and their area of focus was a social media action plan that combined vision-oriented goals with an aggressive schedule of posting procedures for reaching the targeted audiences. Among its goals were to be seen as the, quote, go-to authority for MSU's history, and also, quote, innovators and the authority on campus archaeology. Its targeted audiences included alumni, students, faculty, staff, and the local community in Lansing and East Lansing. The plan emphasized integration of social media and included everyone who had worked on any aspect of the program so that a consistent and frequent message was delivered to its core audiences. As a result, the program was recognized for its field school, 
with an AT&T Award for Innovative Teaching for combining digital and traditional media. The university subsequently reclassified the program as critical and recently made its budget a permanent line item. The second case study is the Society for Historical Archaeology, SHA, um, and this plan was initiated by the Social Media Subcommittee. It was created um, in 2011 as part of its outreach plan, and the subcommittee was looking to provide a resource for membership to interact regularly with the organization and to offer non-members insight into both SHA and the world of historical archaeology. The subcommittee's central tactic was the development of a collaborative blog that was supported by an aggressive community-building campaign on Facebook and Twitter. During 2012, 50 members and committees contributed 125 posts. Followers on Twitter more than doubled to 2,800. Additionally, most of its 1,365 followers on Facebook liked the SHA page during that same period. The foundations for SHA's strategic plan were established by the spring, just in time for the premieres of the National Geographic's Diggers and Spike TV's American Diggers programs. The blog and social media channels became the launch pad for SHA's response. President Paul Mullins proactively issued a public response to the shows, stating, quote, These shows are disappointing, but we can continue to approach them as teaching moments and acknowledge that even thoughtful viewers may not immediately grasp the ethical shortcomings of such methods or understand what they risk losing in the hands of a haphazard metal detector survey. We do not need to surrender our preservation ethics or scholarly rigor. And while we may not transform everybody, we can reach many thoughtful people who respect precise field work, community scholarship, and responsible preservation. SHA shared follow-up posts from its ethics committee regarding the organization's conversations with National Geographic, and it furthered the opportunity for teaching moments by featuring a current topics post from Matt Reeves, who runs a workshop for metal detectorists. The Post discussed his program and provided materials for working with this community in more proactive ways. Four of SHA's top five blog posts cover this issue, accounting for 15% of the blog's traffic in 2012. By prioritizing the development of its digital platforms, SHA was positioned to take advantage of a media controversy to raise awareness, foster advocacy, and inspire action among its identified audiences. It provided members with an instant two-way communication about how the organization was responding to an important issue while it supplied the resources that they could apply to their own work as it relates to a hot topic. At the same time, it presented the organizational position on these issues and, and promoted its available resources to the public and potential members. So the next case study that we're going to look at is the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Now, NCPTT's plan was developed in 2007, just as social media began to enter the popular imagination. Among the agencies of the U.S. National Park Service, NCPTT is very small and remotely located in the small town of Natchitoches, Louisiana. Moreover, its congressional mandate extended well beyond the Park Service to include historic preservationists in general, giving the research it fostered and the technologies of preservation a truly global audience. Because so few of its peers were on the social web at that point, the center's priority was to develop internal savvy and to build a library of digital media content that would engage early adopters in its audience and establish its authority in this area when the rest of its audiences followed. This particular goal was articulated as, quote, a streamlined process empowers NCPTT staff to rapidly deliver media content directly to the web. One objective under this goal called for an organizational migration from a proprietary CMS for the website to an open source version of WordPress. It was among the first U.S. government agencies to make such a leap. With a proprietary CMS, content had to be submitted to the webmaster to format and to post, which created a bottleneck. WordPress's intuitive interface and built-in search optimization functions allowed staff to post high-impact multimedia content immediately to the site. By the end of 2009, NCPTT was featured as Government Video Magazine's website of the week, citing the National Center's use of, quote, photos, videos, podcasts, and every other modern method to demonstrate its research. 
Additionally, the tech blog HoneyTech named the website number four on its international listing of top ten government websites powered by WordPress. Additionally, the WordPress organization chose NCPTT as one of eight U.S. government sites featured in its showcase for outstanding implementation of the CMS. Now next, we're going to talk about the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. The Royal Commission began its digital media planning by embracing the promise of technological and social openness, even while it undertook a frank examination of its limitations toward achieving that promise. The planning process started with a challenge group, comprised of representatives from each of the departments throughout the organization. The group first crafted a description of social media that would communicate its potential to others in the organization. It then set out to link that potential to strategic priorities previously identified by the Royal Commission. The group called for relaxed editorial guidelines in keeping with more authentic engagement on social media platforms and drafted a one-page common-sense policy for using social media. It also emphasized principles of public interaction with its collection through crowdsourced content opportunities, user-generated tagging, and integrated data systems. It began its efforts with a photo-sharing initiative in which it began accepting user-contributed content. The Royal Commission began to allow direct public contributions to its My Canmore Online Image Collections database via the Application Programming Interface, API, of the social media service Flickr. Within six months, more than 2,000 images and 350 text contributions were added by users. The Royal Commission also partnered to hold a social media training series for the Scottish cultural heritage sector. It was titled Digital Futures of Cultural Heritage Education. The collaborators worked to establish a national research agenda for museum and gallery education for the digital age, with a further goal to inform and align policy and practice in the use of social media. The Royal Commission also sponsored a research program called Beyond Text at the University of Edinburgh to explore the role of users in contributing to the public online presence of cultural institutions. By articulating an audience-based vision at the outset of its digital and social media planning, the Royal Commission established an internal mindset of open engagement, which attracted influential partnerships and led to internal technological evolution. The last case study that I'm going to mention is the Chemical Heritage Foundation, which is where I currently work. The Chemical Heritage Foundation crafted its emerging media plan to help reimagine itself as a platform for telling the story of chemistry, using its extraordinarily broad collection of heritage content. This included art, object collections, oral histories, archives, rare books, etc., that expand the entire historical narrative the organization supports. CHF's strategic planning approach advocates a high level of collaboration that's focused on the organization telling stories rather than individual programs. It focuses on the creation of digital assets that meet measurable audience-based needs in the near term, retain ongoing relevance through vigilant curation in the longer term, and continually update data formats that ensure the organization can continue the narrative well into the future. Now, to this end, CHF adopted seven goals for its digital media strategy in the summer of 2012. I'm going to give you one example of that, and that is actually goal number three. CHF provides timely, relevant engagement opportunities for its audiences. So we actually had three objectives with supporting tactics that were identified to support this goal, and the following is one of them. Increase audiences for CHF events by 35% in FY 2013, through a program of interactive online live streaming. So we identified the following tactics to support this objective. The first was use a TriCaster live streaming device for portable in-house production of live streamed events. Second, take advantage of social discovery with simulcast tie-in using Google Hangouts. Three, create a Vimeo channel as a platform for a high quality online archive of event footage. And finally, four, measure views through YouTube Insights, Vimeo Analytics, and streaming logs. So by the end of the 2012 calendar year, CHF had achieved its objectives for live streaming through broadcast of four events. Online audiences for these events more than doubled total attendance with views from around the world. 
The organization has enhanced existing audience engagement experiences and opened them up to a much wider array of audiences with relatively few additional resource requirements. So collectively, these organizations represent a wide range of perspectives related to the preservation of heritage. Their digital strategies reflect that diversity, yet they also share common themes and approach. The first thing is they wrote honest situation analyses. Defining goals, objectives, and tactics for a digital strategy is a process that requires a realistic evaluation of organizational position and responsibilities, whether perceived or actual. This typically examines events and circumstances in the organization, professional fields, or among affected audiences, including internal ones, that can be leveraged for acting on these results. This should also include threats, including those to heritage resources, or situations an organization commonly finds itself in when online engagement could make a difference. It should also include a frank look at the organization's existing technology in comparison to emerging platforms. So the critical leap to success depends on tactics being rooted in larger strategic vision for the organization. In many cases, this has been articulated to some degree with a mission statement or a five-year outlook. While having these directives makes the social media strategic planning process much easier, many heritage organizations either don't have such a document, or it's severely out of date, or, more likely, it lacks measurable accountability. In these cases, a strategic plan for digital media can actually spur a grassroots recognition of the value of defining audiences and measuring expectations of work. Now, related to that is the importance of thoroughly defining and prioritizing audiences. The principles of social media in particular will often engage naturally when you're using social tools while intentionally remembering who your audience is and what drives them. This will make participation from staff and audiences much easier as well. Measurable success in digital strategy depends on articulating every potential audience for the organization and prioritizing those by impact. This will also help focus appropriate digital platforms. So another commonality that these organizations share is that they prioritized monitoring and management of their online engagement. Milestone check-ins are critical to the success of each project. Google Analytics is widely used for evaluation of website traffic. Uh, the free service actually provides a deep level of data on how visitors access and interact with websites, including social media's impact on website traffic. For social media monitoring and posting, Hootsuite was used by most of the organizations that engage on multiple platforms. Hootsuite allows subscribers to collaboratively schedule posts, monitor social media engagement, and respond to audiences through one web-based interface. Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and LinkedIn streams can be organized into tabs, and information from those tabs can be further organized into columns, providing a comprehensive social media dashboard. Now, costs for digital media initiatives vary as widely as the content standards of the organizations, and the greater time put into crafting the plan, the more efficient it will be in the long term. Online audiences value consistent, authentic connection with individuals at an organization over higher production values that are presented in a corporate voice. Agreed upon posting schedules and suggested best practices for documenting field work will keep the short-term costs down for the public engagement side of digital strategy. Based on the situation analysis, greater investment will likely go toward adopting or sustaining storage systems for heritage data that can interface with web-based platforms. Partnerships are vital online. NCPTT collaborated with its local university journalism program in the production side of its online media. NCPTT in turn shared its expertise in helping partner organizations like the Association for Preservation Technology launch their digital initiatives. So one of the ultimate commonalities among these heritage organizations is they all sought to be their own platform. They weren't depending on social media to define them, they were defining their place. So heritage organizations must own their data and take responsibility for continually growing its accessibility. While this is especially important for metadata related to memory collections, it also applies to the organization's collective voice, a critical part of which should be its blog. Unlike social platforms whose fates are controlled by their present companies, 
Most blogging platforms allow backup and migration of data through open formats like XML. With their multimedia capabilities, blogs are the most effective means for dynamic digital storytelling. As was demonstrated with SHA's response to the Diggers television shows, it can also be a place to centralize thought leadership and mobilize audiences. Additionally, its built-in syndication capabilities make automating direct feeds to social media and mobile applications possible. So the last commonality that we see among these heritage organizations is they all sought internal participation. So the approach is to seek organizational buy-in in the long term, but start initial planning with an interdepartmental group of influencers who are most enthusiastic about heritage outreach. Identify the digital interest of staff members and then encourage that through training by people in those areas of expertise. Provide the opportunity to apply those skills with internal engagement opportunities that are internal or to a limited audience. For written posting procedures, one page is ideal for social media policy. Legalistic guidelines discourage internal participation and lessen the effectiveness of online conversation. In conclusion, defining goals, objectives, and tactics in digital planning facilitates a proactive approach for organizations. It ensures that strategic directives can be sustainably accomplished in a world that demands digital accessibility. That goes beyond the traditional archival responsibilities of such organizations to address the current expectation among audiences for ever-present engagement. For any historical narrative, people are both the catalyst and the audience. Much like the digital landscape, these audiences are also diverse and complex. The strategic planning process simplifies focus for both of these areas so that professionals in fields such as archaeology, archives, preservation, conservation, landscapes, and oral history can be more effective in advocating for heritage resources. Thanks again for your time. This is Jeff Guin with the Chemical Heritage Foundation. If you'd like to connect with me online, here are some ways to do that. Appreciate your attention.